This is the uh, Niobrara County Library's Oral History Project. Um, and this is uh, episode two with Anne Whitehead. Um, and uh, so we're going to just continue with where we left off after episode one, Anne. Fine. We were storing hay we were in the storing barn. in the barn. <laughs> Pray continue. <laughs> and I'll just quote my father on this. Uh -huh. uh, the sling full of hay was lifted up, and uh, when it was lifted up, the, here we go, the hooks on each side of the sling were then raised. A halloo was given to the driver of the team out in front of the barn. The team was went forward. The horses probably knew that well. Mm -hmm. The sling was lifted to the second level of the barn to the pulley. The teams kept pulling because when the pulley was reached up above on the second floor, the sling changed the direction from upward to backward, and it moved along a track to the back of the barn loft. At the back of the loft, men were waiting to release the sling. They stood back out of the way, pulled the ropes, releasing the catch that held the center of the sling together, and the hay dropped into the loft. While they immediately went into action to stack the hay in the loft, the open sling went forward on the pulley to the front of the barn and back down to the ground. Oh. The metal catch was fastened once again, bringing the sling together on the ground, and it was ready to receive another load of hay. By then, another buck rake load of hay would be waiting to unload and do the process all over. This was a fairly continuous action once the pattern was set in motion. Goodness. And that was the quote from my father. Mm -hmm. Next thing I asked him about was the carpenter's shed, which was the shop. And it was on the west side of the barn, and that's this present barn that's down there. It's red. Mm -hmm. It's been sheathed in metal, which will probably preserve it forever. Um, the ice house was located immediately west of the carpenter's shed. They were just kind of lined up together. And I'm assuming I, that the ice house had a big pit under it. Underground, kind of? I don't think it did. Oh, it was just so the ice was on top of the ground? It wasn't it, down in a... It wasn't down in it. It had logs around. And my dad said that in the summertime, all of that sawdust was pitched out and kind of spread out. New sawdust was brought in, and some of this old that had dried was reused. Oh. But what they would do would be... Uh, and there were some drawings he made of this, but it was logs around the on four sides with a little entrance. And the ice would be stacked up inside mm -hmm. and then covered pretty extensively with sawdust, mm -hmm. which it's then insulation. kept it insulated. And mm -hmm. I don't know that they threw any, doesn't, he didn't say anything about throwing in, uh, coverings, canvas or anything over it. It was just sawdust, mm -hmm. thick enough. Mm -hmm. And he did say that, uh, oh, I said, along the traverse of the water, the river running there, now the river is usually only a modest stream nowadays. In earlier days, the river must have flowed fuller because according to an early newspaper reporting in the Las Carroll, the river apparently froze over enough in the winter to provide ice to a public ice house in the town of Manville hmm. also, as hmm. well as to the ranch. Hmm. There was a, a next shop was the blacksmith shop was back there and it was located on west. And on a diagram, Fred drew a wood pile stacked up west of the ice house and going on west was the blacksmith shop, and then came the schoolhouse. Hmm. So there were several little buildings, and I do remember those little buildings being there. Did they use the schoolhouse for a schoolhouse? Or? At one time they did. Did they? I did, but that's eventually 
they decided to trade houses. And that is what they indeed did. Must have been a shock to especially my grandmother. Uh, they moved from the Running Water Ranch to the Manville Ranch. And the Manville Ranch at that point in time did not have a bathroom. No indoor plumbing, mm. <laughs> no central heat, mm. which the Running Water Ranch had central heat mm. from a big old furnace in the basement to radiators upstairs. Oh, that's it was fancy. steam heat. Very oh, fancy. Yes. It was for those times. And, and an indoor bathroom. Indoor bathroom. Oh, your, your grandmother must have loved that. Yeah, she, oh, she gave up all change. of that <laughs> to, put, to put the children in school oh, at Manville. Manville. Oh. <laughs> so I, it must have been a shock. But what they did when they moved then in 1900, they added a kitchen and a bathroom and a small room for the hired girl to <laughs> sleep and stay there. <laughs> and that, of course, is still in existence. Mm -hmm. It's still there. It's part of my house. And uh, that was a great shock, I'm sure, because they had to divide one of the bedrooms upstairs. And uh, the, because my, there were three boys and one girl, so mm -hmm. they had to have a bath bedroom for the girl another bedroom for Jean, and then my father shared a bedroom, small bedroom off to the side with his brother Kenneth, uh -huh. but the only bathroom was downstairs. <laughs> and grandfather and grandmother had the bedroom on the east. So and that was quite a change for her, quite I'm sure. All for the sake of school. But she told me one time, she said, I really enjoyed more time down there in Manville than I ever did in my life. Oh. <laughs> oh, interesting. So interesting. Well, the little schoolhouse um, did it. It was used as a school, so they must have had a school it, teacher. Yes, they did have a teacher who came, uh -huh. and she stayed, of course, with them in the house. Oh, and uh, yes, because distances, of course, people couldn't travel no, too far no. at times, and so no, she stayed there. And but they finally decided that uh, it would be better if they made the move. If the ki kids were getting older, I suppose. Getting older. Mm -hmm. uh, and that schoolhouse in Manville is no longer there. Mm. It was a little wooden frame schoolhouse. Hmm. But that's what they did, and uh, they moved forward from there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, so we're up to the and, schoolhouse. Yes. And uh, painting. My dad said that the house received several coats of paint in summer about every other year. Oh my goodness. He loved to have everything painted up. And uh, he said he, the painter would arrive in the spring and spend the summer painting everything on the place that mm -hmm. needed sprucing up, as he put it. <laughs> did they have a bunkhouse or something? For all these? Yes, they did have a bunkhouse. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I imagine they'd have to with all these people spending lots of time there. <laughs> yeah. And where was the bunkhouse? Well, it was oh, on the other, it was the east side. And that little bunkhouse, I think, is still there, I think. Hmm. And then later, my Uncle George um, became, uh, as a hobby, he never married, and he, he had a hobby of trotting horses. And he used to go back to Kentucky and buy these horses and have them shipped out to the ranch. And of course, trotting races were very prominent then on fairs, and they even had, I guess, races that were just the trotting horse races. So that became quite a, an event for him, and he had many, many horses he brought out there to the oh, ranch. Is that right? He built this lovely barn, which is still there, and uh, kept all of his records for them, and unfortunately all of his paperwork and records were never saved. Mm. But uh, I have the names of a lot of those <laughs> horses. Well, that's exciting. <laughs> Huh. Oh, but um, Mr. Hardigan did the painting. He painted the ranch house and all the buildings many times. He also painted the brown house, which was the Wilson's house in Lusk. Mm. Some people nowadays call that the Bass House. The Basses bought it, but they didn't build it. <laughs> it was built by the Wilsons, and it was completed in about 1913. Now, where is that house? 
It is cat a corner from the present Episcopal Church. Ah. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And it has a little uh, carriage house behind it. Oh, uh huh. And also a little tiny orch apple orchard that my grandfather planted. No kidding. That thing still, those trees the leaf trees out in the spring. Amazing. Ah. <laughs> Mr. Hardigan also painted the white car. As he, as I recall, he didn't repaint it. It was getting dull, and he varnished it, putting many coats on it. On the car. On the car. <laughs> Now, about the sheep. There was a siding, this is my father, there was a siding called Wilson Spur, south of the Running Water Ranch House across the railroad tracks. There was a chute to load the sheep. They also loaded the wool there, hauling it down from the cabin when the mm -hmm. shearing was done, because they did the dipping and the mm -hmm. shearing and everything. They brought the sheep in, brought them down, actually brought them down from, uh, the Harney. Harney is where Jim Edwards eventually had a ranch. That's right. Yes, and Jim Edwards was a key feature in the raising and care of the sheep. Hmm. He was a remarkable sheep man, hmm. apparently. Hmm. And uh, always found water for them and uh, my grandfather and Uncle George encouraged him to buy some land, finally. Mm -hmm. And they surveyed the land for him, and that's the land up there. And uh, he built a remarkable house. It's a, it's a stone house. It's still standing, isn't it? I, I haven't been up there for many years. I but heard that it was. <laughs> he built stones around many things, the wells and the house, and around several little buildings he built there. And uh, my father and his brother, Kenneth, used to go up there in summers and work. The folks would send them up there, and they kind of got into knowing what was all about the sheep business <laughs> because a little homestead cabin was built by a relative, an eastern relative who came out, and it adjoined uh, Jim Edwards' place. Mm -hmm. So the, Kenneth and Fred, my dad Fred, went up there summers and worked with hmm. the Jim uh -huh. on the sh taking care of the sheep oh. so they'd get acquainted with that. Oh. <laughs> and uh, mouthing out the ewes, they looked in their mouths and can tell, tell their approximate age. The old ones they would sell. Scab, a mangy skin condition, was a kind of disease and sheep pick up a lot of ticks. Also before the shearing went on, they would run the sheep through the dipping vat. This was at the running water ranch where cleaning, disinfecting chemicals had been added. They would run them through the water to get the sand and dirt out of the fleece. And then a Mr. Heffelfinger, <laughs> <laughs> wonderful name, a wool buyer. He eventually came out and he would buy every clip that the Wilson brothers did because he knew the quality of their wool. And my dad said he would arrive and uh, he would never go out and look at the wool. And he would just come to visit, and he said he would spend about a week just visiting and <laughs> enjoying being there and uh, buy the wool. And as a sort of a special thing, he uh, arranged for a visit for my uncle and my great uncle and my grandfather. Uh, and I'll quote my father on this. He would arrange at the ranch, giving a passing look at the wool because he knew the quality was fine, and stay about a week just for a visit. At one time, he arranged for Eugene and George, while they were in New England visiting relatives, to tour the American woolen mills, then located in Lawrence, Massachusetts. But that American woolen mills is still in business. Mm. Amazingly, mm -hmm. I looked it up. <laughs> Uh, and where the Wilson wool was sold, the American woolen. As part of their visit, they were to select wool fabric for two suits each to be made up by Taylor in New York City, <laughs> where they would stop on their way home to Wyoming. 
all at the behest of Mr. Heffelfinger. Oh, wonderful. Yes. <laughs> Fred recalled his father and uncle wearing these suits for many years. <laughs> so they sold out. Uh, Fred recalled the change. They were building up a herd of registered Hereford cattle. Dad went back to Iowa and bought some bulls when they went into the registered business. This is quoting my father. Uncle George just kind of sat back and took his share of the profits, whatever they were. <laughs> Whenever he wanted a little extra money, he got it. This apparent together but separate financial arrangement stood them in good stead during the 1920s. The Bank of Lusk, where Eugene, but not George, was heavily invested, closed its doors unexpectedly, devouring not only monies Eugene had on deposit there, but a considerable amount he subsequently brought to the Lusk Bank from Douglas's Converse mm. Bank. Oh dear. In his redemption effort to help those severely affected by the Lusk Bank's closure, mm. Eugene's efforts proved of no avail, as those responsible for the Lusk Bank's demise were rallied only for their own recovery. Mm. It was then that George's separate funds kept the Running Water Ranch oh, afloat. Amazing. What year was that? Do you know when that uh, was? It was in the mid-1920s. Oh, goodness. That's a story. Yeah. And the ranch, of course, never was quite as... Uh, financially able as it had been before, sure. but There's at least they were still going. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my. Yep. That was even before the Depression caused the banks to fail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the railroad uh, came through the ranch, and uh, my grandfather apparently was not in favor of that happening, and he went down a several times, I guess, to Cheyenne, according to what my dad told me, trying to persuade them to move the railroad a little farther south, but it didn't work. They mm -hmm. wanted to go right, right along. Up the river. And of course, that has been boggy land in there. Mm -hmm. They are constantly working on it to this day mm -hmm. because it's very spongy down in there. <laughs> and uh, But the, the grade is good. Yeah. <laughs> yep. It's okay in that respect, Joe. <laughs> uh, well, um, the railroad construction crews were made welcome. This is Fred again. The cabin in its ideal location became their headquarters during the building of surrounding portions of the trackage, with tents for their housing and their meals hmm. being erected all around the cabin. What proved an interesting sidelight was one of the construction engineers being a photographer. Eugene became his apt pupil, learning how to take and develop photos. He purchased necessary equipment, and photography became one of his lifelong interests. Hmm. Well, now this and was, that was my grandfather. And that was your grandfather, and this was um, the railroad came through in 1886 or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. This was even before the house was built. Oh, that was 1880 before the big house was built. What was built in 1890? The house. The big house. Yeah, so this, this was, was a, and Jean wasn't married at that point. Oh. He I didn't see. marry till 1890 when the house was built. Oh, oh, so he was just there with his brother. Yes, and, and they were living in the cabin. In the cabin, okay. And it was just the tents all around. That's right. I, that there, I have a photograph that shows, and it's, I'm sure some of the railroad men Oh. And they're sitting beside the cabin, and they're all just sitting there cross-legged <laughs> in a big room, and somebody took their picture. <laughs> well, probably the man that taught him how to, right. taught Jeannie how to take yeah. pictures. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> funny. Fred recalled, I remember seeing the camera. He had a great big box he had that stuff in. Dad did the whole thing, the developing and all. <laughs> I have a wonderful picture of... Um, two Indians standing in the doorway of the cabin. And it was about around that time, probably, because they used to come, there's an Indian trail that comes through the ranch, and it used, used to be able to see it with the Trevois, the oh, yes. 
they would go between the Agate Ranch, James Cook said, but uh, Agate Ranch down south of Harrison. Mm -hmm. They would go from there and trail up to the Pumpkin Butte area in the summertime. Now, where is Pumpkin Butte? Well, it's west of here, oh. west and a little north. Oh. And they that was their summer uh, place they'd go. Mm -hmm. And these Indians, I'm sure, came past the cabin. Mm -hmm. Sure. And would stop and visit. And they're wrapped in blankets and standing there. Oh, wow. And it's, it's probably George, because Gene was probably taking the picture. He's standing mm -hmm. in the cabin door visiting with them. Hmm. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. That is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> you have that photo. <laughs> yeah. And horse and buggy days. It was automobile time. Dad, Fred said, Dad bought the white, and that was in 1909. We have pictures of that. Uncle George bought the Cadillac in 1913. He still had the white. Dad drove. Uncle George drove a little bit, but he was not crazy about it. They were neither one of them what I would call first-class drivers. <laughs> <laughs> never had trucks and no tractors. Hmm. Uncle George never would have driven those. He always liked to rake, but with horse-drawn equipment. Dad bought the Vili. Later on, he bought a Buick. That was Uncle George's Cadillac here at Manville. And uh, Phyllis mentioned something about this car being given to this track drive. Uh, it was Uncle George's. That particular automobile was still at the Manville Ranch until World War II, when a call went out for metal to be used for scrap mm -hmm. for the war effort. Fred's brother Gene donated this Cad Cadillac car to the scrap drive without Fred's knowledge <laughs> and much to his dismay when he learned of it. <laughs> Fred said he always secretly hoped the car didn't end up as scrap and someone instead spirited it away okay. to their garage. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, Phyllis said that she and, the, and the, her used to play in those. Play in it, yes. yes. And that they were just really well, discouraged when they fun. disappeared. Because yes, it had those lanterns on yeah. each side, you know. They pretended they were driving. Honk horns. <laughs> I used to climb up in that myself and sit there just imagining. Ah, this is an interesting note. Fred, Uncle George bought the Cadillac in Denver, one of the earliest cars to be introduced in Wyoming. Though he and Dad continued during their lifetimes to buy automobiles, never of the, neither of them learned to drive well. Uncle George may have decided by then someone beside himself needed to learn how to drive an automobile. The purchase agreement was the dealer would have the car delivered to the ranch by someone who would stay a while mm. to teach prospective <laughs> drivers. This man, attired in appropriate livery, arrived and stayed at the ranch about a week. Oh, you had a chauffeur. <laughs> yes. Fred, about 15 then, became his apt pupil. Mm -hmm. Quickly loving, it, developing a love for cars and driving, he became the available in-house chauffeur. <laughs> During those days, it was more than just sitting beside the wheel. Fred said no trip was ever made without having at least one flat tire mm -hmm. and a supply kit for anything possible happening was always brought along. <laughs> now there was a cute story that Mamie Ord and she was uh, Gertrude Chamberlain's mother. And the Ords had a ranch down south of Lusk. And she was a longtime family friend. All of them were smiling and chuckling as she recalled this story. The Ord Ranch was about seven miles southwest of the Running Water and east-west of the Rawhide. A road going past their ranch house eventually landed you in Guernsey. Mrs. Ord recalled seeing many times a touring car coming down the road with a small young boy at the wheel in the front seat and two towering men who were George and Jean enjoying their <laughs> ride in the back seat. 
<laughs> their destination was likely Guernsey, home of their youngest brother, Edmund, ranch foreman for Charles Guernsey. And Mrs. Ord chuckled the whole time she was telling this story to me. <laughs> Two big men in the back seat Too being much. chauffeured by a 15-year-old boy. Peeking over the yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, let's see. There was some, uh, we had, oh, they had a, they had lots of summer visitors. They had Eastern relatives came from New England that used to come. And when people would come to visit, of course, in those days, they stayed a while. They didn't just come out and visit for the afternoon and leave. They expected to stay maybe a month, maybe two. Well, it was a just relatively pending. long trip, too. Yes, mm -hmm. and uh, not too easy to get there. Expensive. Yeah. Uh, and there was uh, a young Eastern cousin that came out, and he delighted the kids. They loved him. He was college age. And uh, I won't bore you with stories, but there's some funny, funny stories about him. Uh, oh, tell us one. Tell us one. Okay. <laughs> Here's Julian Wilson and the swimming hole. Okay, good. This is Fred telling this. Uncle George encouraged Julian, which was his name, to build the diving board. Lazy Julian. Uncle George helped him select the board. He was quite a fellow. He really struck us. We gave him a good audience to play to. His great trick was to light a cigarette with his tongue, flip it backwards into his mouth, jump off the diving board, and when he surfaced, flip the cigarette, still burning, <laughs> out between his lips and casually take a puff. I could see it. <laughs> we say, do, do it, it again. again. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so he would do it again. <laughs> he was a quite a little, and this is Fred too, he said he was quite a little older than Gene, Fred's oldest brother, a college kid who came out for the summer. I looked the dates up. Julian was actually only about a year older than Gene. Oh. He maybe just seemed older to Fred. <laughs> A little bit more um, sophisticated, perhaps. Y yes. <laughs> a worldly fellow. A worldly, yes. Well, there was another funny one. And this is a cute story, because it relates to all the early days out there. Julian goes to the frontier days. Fred. Dad and Uncle George had a horse out there in the corral they wanted to have broken for a saddle horse. Julian asked Uncle George to let him ride him. The obvious answer was no. Uncle George went somewhere. Frontier Days came along shortly after. Julian was left with the hired man. Soon after, Julian came up missing. Uncle George came home. Julian was gone. Where was Julian? The unbroken horse that had been in the corral was also gone. <laughs> Who turned the horse out? They, the hired man did see him ride off. There was a lot, little bit of pandemonium among the Wilson group. <laughs> there you have the basis for a story. Now this is Fred talking. They checked in at Guernsey with Ed Wilson, Eugene and George's brother. Uncle Ed said, hadn't seen him at all. A fella came in and checked in overnight, but he went on. Uncle Ed was a perfect cover-up man for Julian, as it was the sort of prank he himself would get a great <laughs> kick out of. He ended up on the fence down at Frontier Days. Back at the ranch, after many frantic inquiries, they finally found out that someone who answered his description was indeed down at Frontier Days. That's quite a lot of miles. That's a lot of miles, huh? isn't it? After enjoying several days at the great event, Julian rode back with the horse, who by then was fairly tamed down. <laughs> <laughs> what a kid. I wonder, he, wonder whatever he, happened to Julian. Well, I, yes, I, I now I wonder, I wonder. Oh. It, I, I have the name of his parents, and I intend to ask some Eastern relatives if they, if they remember Julian, mm -hmm. because 
and I wrote this in. I said, would be fun to have more Julian stories, and there probably were more. (laughs) (laughs) Now, how many minutes? Stagecoach journey north from Cheyenne. I'm wondering if you want to take a break. Let's do. It's been about a half an hour. Okay. Let's take a break.